Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for today's uh, Select Science webinar entitled Polymer Analysis Using MoldyTOF. My name is Dr. Lois Mantineau Byrne and I will be moderating today's presentation. I'm delighted to be joined by MoldyTOF expert Dr. Volker Sauerland, who is the Senior Application Scientist at Brooker. In this webinar, Volker will explain the benefits of MoldyTOF and how it can be used to enhance your QC or R&D lab's polymer analysis. He'll also explore fast QC methods and direct measurements for various polymer types. After the presentation, we'll move on to the question, question and answer session. Please feel free to ask any questions for the Q&A session at any time during the webinar. You can submit your questions at the left of your screen. Without further delay, I would like to hand over to Volker for today's presentation, and I would like to thank him for presenting to us today. Please go ahead, Volker. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, so I would like to talk today about the Malditov um, mass spectrometer in the area of industrial polymers. Um, now, the first question might arise, what is the advantage of a Molditov in general um, using this instrument in the um, polymer lab? So the first answer is, of course, what we have with the Molditov, we have access directly to the molecular masses of synthetic polymers, calculating on the fly, calculating average molecular masses, um, and even end group detection is possible with the Molditov. So it's very simple afterwards also in the, in the interpretation of the results because compared to other ionization techniques like electrospray, we mainly work with singly charged ions in the Molditov and therefore the spectra complexity that we finally have to interpret is much, much lower compared to electrospray instruments. A very, very big advantage of the Molditov is of course it's extremely fast. So the Sample, from the sample preparation to the final result, we typically have a few minutes, not more, including sample preparation. Maybe it's 10 minutes, but not more. Um, also with the Molditov, it's not generally not limited in the mass range at all. So we have analyzed, or friends of mine have analyzed also molecular weight uh, samples up to a million. And um, so it's very, very, um, easy to go for higher molecular weight species as well. <clears throat> and finally, one advantage of the Molditov is also because it works with solid samples or mixtures of solid samples and the matrix. We are also able to work with insoluble samples. Even nanoparticles and polymer surfaces can be analyzed with the Molditov. So maybe some of you have never heard about the Molditov. For those, I would like to introduce here two videos that we have put on YouTube. And uh, it's both, the upper left is about the Molditov process, and in the second video, you have the um, explanation of the Molditov tof so a fragmentation process. Um, feel free to watch these videos. If you just look for Brucker and Molditov, Molditov tof you will find them on YouTube. In the next slide now, as I said, I have uh, in the first slide that Malditov is a very, very fast kind, uh, way of analyzing your polymer samples. I would like to show you with this video here, which is showing our data acquisition software, Flex Control. I would like to show you how fast it really is. On the upper left, you see the sample carrier, this black area there. On the right side, you see the spectrum view below the sample carrier picture, you have the sample carrier plate, a picture of the sample carrier plate, uh, or graphics of the sample carrier plate where you can select the sample spots, which I just did here in this case. Before starting the acquisition, we have to choose a correct acquisition method. And after this is done, then I can go to my sample and the acquisition method contains all the settings of the instrument, so generally you don't have to care about anything in the measurement, you just adjust the laser intensity. This is something that you always have to do because depending 
on the sample preparation, on the kind of sample that you have, you always have to work with slightly different uh, laser settings here. So this is the only thing what you should do. Now I'm acquiring the spectrum already. I'm acquiring from different areas of the sample spot just to get a good average spectrum of the whole sample. Typically I do it on from four, five, six positions like this. And afterwards, after I've done this, I just save the spectrum, give it a name, and also put comments in here or other stuff. I just save it automatically, transfer it afterwards to our post-processing software, which I don't need now. Then I go to my Calibrant spectrum because I want to have the most accurate mass that I can get, and therefore I prepared a Calibrant. Uh, in this case, it's a polyethylene glycol standard in the low molecular weight range of approximately 2,000. Um, on the neighboring spot, and now I acquiring under identical conditions, I acquire the spectrum of this PEC sample. Again, give it a name and save the spectrum. And then we switch over to the flex analysis post processing. First, we go for the calibrant, do the calibration to calibrate in general the transfer of the time of flight to the mass. So I select my mass list. Then afterwards, I can always check the errors, which is the second last column here. Typically, the errors in this mass range are below 1 ppm mass error in the internal calibration. So I just accept this calibration, copy this calibration to my clipboard, and transfer it to my sample. This was the calibrant, and now it's the sample. So I have my fully calibrated sample spectrum now, and I can do the analysis easiest with the PolyTools software. So I just upload the spectrum to PolyTools, the spectrum, and down here in the table, uh, you can see already the calculations because I have selected the processing on the fly with a little radio button. In this drop box in the middle part of the software, I can also make pre-selections like here, just calculate on the polyethylene glycol, uh, glycol standard. And then I directly get the analysis, um, the final analysis result, which gives me the combination of the methoxy and uh, hydrogen and sodium. So the cation and the um, two end groups of the polymer and of course, also PolyTools calculates the MN, MW, dispersity values, and so on. If we take a closer look at the software, um, this is in the end what you've seen before. So what we can do in the center part of this graphical user interface, we can make pre-definitions, so pre-selecting end groups, for example, pre-selecting monomer units, how we want to do our calculation. Um, Next is the, the spectrum itself. From the spectrum itself, the program calculates the monomer mass unit just by the distance of the peaks. And um, yeah, of course, also from these peaks, it calculates the average masses of the polymer, and it makes suggestions for end groups. So these end groups can, of course, modify it as you like in a, in a simple editor. Yeah, how do polymer spectra look in different mass ranges? So in the low molecular weight range, what we've already seen now, this was 2000 in the example in the little movie. Um, here we have a polyethylene glycol at 600 Dalton, which shows a very nice distribution. Indeed, it shows more than one distribution. So we have different end groups here or different cations, and that's why we d see different ion series here. As you can see in the upper insert, in the upper right insert, we have a pretty nice resolution here separating the isotope peaks from each other. If we go a bit higher, this is an example at 3.5 kilodalton or 4 kilodalton for polypropylene glycol. Uh, still, we get a very nice isotopic resolution. We always label the monoisotopic peaks and calculate the areas on the complete isotopic pattern. Um, and here we can easily do end group analysis and uh, average mass calculations, of course. If we still go further, 
and to higher masses, then we have the possibility only to resolve the oligomers. We don't see the isotopic pattern anymore because, yeah, it's just sooner or later you reach the limit of the, the performance of the instrument at 100 kilodalton. We see the oligomers still separated, which is good for a calculation of the repeating unit, and of course, average masses can also calculate it from these kind of spectra. Now I would like to show you on, a, um, on the basis of a few applications that customers and colleagues in Japan, um, yeah, and myself as well, ran on synthetic polymer characterization. And I would like to start with some applications really characterizing synthetic polymers. And the first one is, um, the first one is something that you might also have in your hands every day. It's a PET bottle, polyethylene terephthalate. And it's two different kinds of bottles from two different vendors. And the difference here is that the upper spectrum is taken from a bottle which is made for cold green tea. And the lower one is made for hot green tea. And now the question is, what's the difference between these two bottles? And if you just acquire a spectrum like we did it a few minutes ago in the little video, um, then you get this result, and if you zoom in, then you can easily separate several series in the spectrum, and the series show that one of the series, uh, the, the one with the highest mass, which is also indicated here by an arrow, is much, much stronger in intensity. And if you just put this spectrum now to polytools, then polytools will immediately give you the results um, yeah, giving you the, the structures in the end of the polymer and potential end groups. As I said, all these end groups, of course, can be put into the um, table in the table editor. So in the end, in this uh, yeah, tool where you set up all your uh, information about your potential polymers. And this is really an absolute straightforward analysis. So. It's Time consumption is about, yeah, like you've seen a few minutes, nothing more. Okay. Um, as on the next slide here, you see two publications, two out of very, very many, um, on different kinds of, of uh, yeah, conductive polymers, it's mainly. So the, the left one is about, yeah, solar cells or using conductive polymers in solar cells, and the right one is in transistors. In this kind of, um, or these kind of materials, um, often, not always, but often contain uh, highly conjugated uh, polymers like polythiophene, quite often modified polythiophenes because thiophenes themselves are not soluble. Um, and you always have to be a bit careful with the, with the interpretation of these spectra as well. So we once had a sample here. It was a polythiophene, which was just generated by oxidation with uh, iron chloride, iron-3 chloride. And in this oxidation process, what you typically would expect is the um, upper series, which is here indicated, showing the lowest masses in each uh, signal cluster. And this is in the end the polymer, which contains hydrogen as end groups. And the iron chloride was only meant to be as a oxidation, uh, oxidizing um, yeah, substance in the, in the synthesis. Now, what finally turns out, if you put this spectrum into polytools, then you would directly see that the main series which is the lowest mass in the end in each cluster, is it again, is only appearing at a very, very low percentage in this table on the second last column. You always see the percentage of the individual ion series, how strong they appear in the spectrum. And the thiophene with the hydrogen termination is just close to 5%. While another one, for example, the next series, which is listed here in the table, which contains a bromide, as, a, um, as one end group and a hydrogen at the other end group, this already has an abundance of 15.4%.
and also with two bromine. So you find the complete set of uh, bromine and chlorine um, <clears throat> end groups here in this synthesis. So definitely this synthesis has to be optimized to really if people only want to generate hydrogen terminated polythiophenes. If you go a bit closer in the look, then you can assign the different series here in the spectrum with different uh, yeah, chemical formula. And if you really want to confirm these chemical compositions, then of course you can also go to the isotopic pattern because in the lower molecular weight range, we still have the performance to resolve these isotopic pattern, not like at 100 kilodalton. Um, here we have the possibility now to compare the simulated and uh, yeah, and observed isotopic patterns of the different compounds. And as you can see here on the left hand picture, on the upper trace we have the spectrum and down is the simulation for a ion signal containing a bromine and a chloride as N groups. And you still you see the characteristic plus two isotopic pattern in this spectrum and as well in the simulation. On the left hand uh, on the right hand side, sorry, you also see the, the comparison of a, um, of a spectrum and the simulation. In this case, we only have hydrogen as the terminating end groups. And the plus two isotopic pattern is still there because it's a lot of, that's four sulfur atoms, uh, five sulfur atoms, sorry. Um, no, 20 sulfur atoms already in there. Um, and the thing is that in this case, of course, the sulfur also gives you a strong impact on the, um, on the isotopic pattern, but not as much as the bromine and the chlorine on the left-hand side. Okay. That's the, another application on the characterization of a synthetic polymer. In this case, it's really that we want to analyze a <clears throat> hard disk. So if you have a hard disk in any computer, of course, this hard disk is built up in many, many different layers. So it's the hard disk drive itself. Then on top of this, you have the magnetic layer. Then you have a protective film because you want, don't want to destroy the magnetic layer. And then on the upper, upper surface, you have a very, very thin lubricating film, which is typically um, made out of a perfluor polyether, <clears throat> and this perfluor polyether um, is more or less just a monolayer on the surface, which keeps the magnetic head slider away from the protective film and the, the magnetic layer. And the question in this case was, how robust is this lubricating film on the surface? It's pretty tough to analyze such a monolayer on a, on a hard disk. Um, so what my colleagues um, in Japan did, they ran an imaging experiment because they also wanted to find out what is the influence of this um, magnetic head slider on the surface of the hard disk drive itself. So the experiment was going like this, that they had the uh, reading head, the magnetic head slider, on a certain position. They speeded up this, uh, the hard disk very strong. They did the complete experiment under reduced pressure, and this gives a very, very strong stre uh, high stress to the lubricating film. With this experiment set uh, experimental setup, they just wanted to test how much of the lubricating film is really removed from the surface during this uh, test. The final uh, experiment was done in an imaging experiment. That means on the surface of the hard disk where the magnetic head slider was located, they choose a certain area where they just took a um, took pixel by pixel, they took the spectra and finally got something like you see here on the upper left. So this is the definition on the upper left on the A, um, uh, picture A. There's in yellow, you see the area that was imaged and the red dotted line, which is a bit hard to see maybe, this is the position of the, um, the head of the hard disk. Um, and what they did now is pixel by pixel, they acquired spectra from the complete 
um, area, which is indicated here by the yellow dotted line. What they finally got out is on the right-hand side in, in picture B, you see the sum spectrum of the whole area. Um, and then you can go, just go and pick out a few masses out of this sum spectrum and see the distribution of these peaks over the whole area that was um, um, imaged in this case. Now I have to mention something else because there were polymers involved in this uh, lubricating film, and it's two polymers with different end groups. And what you see here is on the C and on the E picture, you see the uh, signals or the distribution of certain signals <coughs> belonging to one end group distribu distribution, so one end group combination. And on the pictures D and F, you see the other end group distribution. And what's quite obvious is that if you compare, for example, C and D, so the different end groups, that in the C experiment or on the C mass, much more of the lubricating film was removed compared to the spectrum in, or to the picture com uh, that you see on the, yeah, in D. So therefore, the stability of the film could be easily checked with this experiment and also the binding performance of the different polymers uh, on the surface, even if it's just the monolayer film, could be checked with this experimental setup. Now I would like to switch to a different topic, and this is more about additives, and uh, because a polymer is often not just a polymer, it also contains additives. And these additives, of course, also play a major role in the performance of uh, polymeric materials. I would start again with a little introduction. One of our customers, Clemens Schwarzinger from Linz University, he did a very nice experiment in collaboration also with uh, Borealis, which is a um, polyolefin company, producing company in the neighborhood in, in uh, in Austria there, in Linz. And um, polyolefins, of course, are pretty hard to detect, but additives within these polypropylene samples that he now used for his experiments, <clears throat> they can be easily um, yeah, detected with a Molditov as well. So what you see here in the center picture uh, the Malditov data is just uh, the spectrum that he finally got from such a polymer sample containing different additives. So it's in the end, uh, yeah, stabilizers, oxidation stabilizers, UV stabilizers um, that were in this polymer sample. And what Clement Schwarzinger even did was going one step further. So he added an internal standard for quantitation to his sample, and with this standard, he could really quantify the amounts of these antioxidants and uh, UV stabilizers in the polymer sample. Uh, for his sample preparation, because polypropylene is not that easily soluble, uh, for his sample preparation, in this case, Clemens Schwarzinger used the solvent-free moldy preparation, so this is really uh, that you just mix your sample matrix and salt outside in a mortar and just put it on your sample target. And this is really simple, straightforward, and specific. Another thing which will still, and further on, um, be a topic in any processing uh, process or <laughs> um, is the check of the quality of incoming goods, for example. Um, and one of the topics right now is, again, silent change, because in a supply chain, it might happen that substances are used which are not allowed anymore. So from July, so just in two months, we have, again, some substances which are banned from production or at least limited. Um, so we have a few namely four of phthalates here, which are listed here, and they are banned from production of anything from July 2019 on. 
So now how can you check that really your supplier follows these rules? The only thing what you can do is, is really do a quality control in, of incoming goods. And how can this happen? So a silent change is generally something which happens if a supply chain is working very nice. So you have a material supplier um, which supports a second material supplier, then out of these materials, a third uh, company builds the parts, and finally you have the product manufacturer who, who uses these parts. Now, what can happen is, of course, that the product manufacturer asks for a discount. And what happens to the part supplier is, of course, that he will also ask his material supplier for the discount. And what can now happen is that the material supplier does not use the material supplier A anymore, but switches. He searches for another supplier of this um, chemical substance or whatever, and just changes the supplier without letting the product manufacturer know. And finally, it happens that suddenly the product that the product manufacturer produces is not good anymore. So we have a failure in this supply chain, and we now have to find out where is it coming from. And this also happened to QCR. They produce also, or they, they as a, from a, the material supplier, they get a conductive paste uh, for their chips. And this conductive paste contains different compounds. So it contains copper or silver, uh, copper and gold particles, contains epoxy resin, additives, solvents, and filler. And if any of these materials is changed, of course, it might happen that the conductive paste is not working properly anymore. And finally, you have the, um, yeah, the fault in the, the final product that uh, Xiosera produces. So what they did at Coursera for quite some time already is just that they did a quality control using 2D TLC. But unfortunately, this was not sufficient because the things that were changed in the composition by the material supplier, this were not detectable by just UV staining. Um, by UV, it was not visible in the UV light. And therefore, Coursera now goes a, uh, another step and they just image the complete TLC plate that they have um, used before already using an Autoflex system. And with this, they now could also detect the substances which were missing or which were changed in the conductive paste finally. And now what they build up is that they, they have, a, in the end, they have data from good uh, conductive paste so they put this into a software, which is Skills, which is a statistical software that we also use for the analysis of uh, um, yeah, tissue samples, where we do imaging experiments from. They will use this uh, Skills Lab software now for the quality control of your sample. And whenever the, the match of the detected ions in different areas of the TLC plate is better than 90%, then the sample is OK. And if it's not matching more than 90%, then most likely there was a silent chain somewhere in change somewhere in the supply chain, and this is now how the yeah quality control is done for this conductive paste there at Coursera. So this is in the end a mixture of polymer material, of course, and also on additives. And finally, another um, application that my colleagues, again, from Japan did um, together with NITO. And in NITO, they were yeah, checking uh, antioxidants and how the antioxidants behave under strong um, illumination. So this experimental setup was like this, that they had a film on the glass slide that they illuminated very strongly with a UV lamp, with a clean-on arc lamp in the UV light um, under atmospheric pressure. And they only illuminated a very special pattern, so these three circles there. And afterwards, what they did, they did the imaging run again and um, took the different spectra from different areas, pixel by pixel from this uh, slide, and you could directly see the three dots that they illuminated with a xenon uh, lamp 
were appearing in with different masses. So at, in this case, it was a decomposition product from um, yeah, the oxidation. Um, this is in the end an experiment which can optimize the performance of, or not can optimize, but can help to optimize the performance of additives um, in a polymer. So you could directly visualize, or not only visualize, but also see the impact and get information about chemical structure of your uh, structural changes of your additives. In general, as you have already seen in uh, in the Kyocera uh, workflow, TLC might play quite some role in the um, in the work with synthetic polymers as well. Even if TLC moldy until now was mainly be used in, in pharmaceutical industry, partly um, cosmetic industry, and often working with lipids. But uh, in the next slides, I will also show you that you can also work with TLC or use TLC for the separation of synthetic polymers, of course. So the standard workflow in the TLC is, of course, that after the um, development, you check your, for your bands in the UV light, and then you get the picture which is displayed here on the left-hand side. So under UV, you see several bands, and the only thing what you get out of these bands is the RF. So you know how good your um, substances moved with the, with the front of the, the solvent. Now, if you do a multi-imaging experiment, which is uh, displayed here in the center, then you would go pixel by pixel and scan the whole TLC plate, and you can visualize afterwards the different areas. Again, um, like it looks quite similar to the UV, um, picture, but now you get the additional information about the, um, yeah, you have the mass spectrum in the background, and the mass spectrum, of course, tells you things about the chemical composition of your lipids in this case. Now, to make it a bit faster, we don't have to acquire every pixel here. We can only go along the lane and acquire our data, take our spectra, and then we get a MS chromatogram like you see it on the right hand side. In this case, we just go from the lower part of the lane to the upper part, so from R of 0 to 1, and get our data. And on the y axis, we have the RF now, and on the x axis, we have the masses. And what we do now is we look on top of our spectra, and what we see our spectra now appearing as different highlighted zones. So whenever there's a strong peak, then you see the the red area here and the green area or the green and red boxes, pink boxes, these are just different compounds appearing in the different areas on the TLC plate. And this is in the end enough. And this saves some time and it's absolutely simple. We have a program which you can just go through. It's visit driven, so it's pretty easy also to set up such an automatic run on the on the TLC plate. <coughs> Sorry. And as I mentioned before, it's not only limited to, to lipids, even if lipids is still the, the most common uh, substance class, I must say, uh, in TLC moldy. But you can also separate, for example, in this case, it's different kinds of packs. So we have a, a, yeah, a star um, pack here, so a glycerol etoxylate. And on the other hand side, we have a MPEG, so with a methyl and hydroxy group um, termination, and you can clearly separate these two substance classes. Um, and additionally, beside of this, of course, the nice thing about TLC moldy is that you can even acquire MSMS data from such a TLC plate. <clears throat> and afterwards, if you have acquired the MSMS data, you see a clear difference in the MSMS data of linear and branched packs. So this is now not the methoxy, but in this case we have the, the standard pack in the upper picture of the polytools evaluation. And you see two series that show up in this case um, in the higher mass range. So higher means here in the mass range between 400 and the, the parent ion. 
coming in the end from the fragmentation on, of the two sides of the, the pack chain and on the, in the lower area of the spectrum, in the lower mass range of the spectrum, up to 300 approximately, you see some peaks which are really internal fragments of the pack chain. If we now change to the branched pack, you get a different situation because you get one distribution which goes down here, yeah, uh, which go, goes about a third down from the parent iron mass down to 600 Dalton approximately. This is this red iron series. And then we have a second distribution connected um, in the medium mass range and the third one in the lower mass range. And this clearly shows you, due to this fragmentation alone, that this is not a linear um, polyacetylene glycol, that, but it's a branched one. So simple from the MSMS -MS spectrum, you can easily see, well, this is linear, this is branched. In this case, you don't even need the TLC separation. So if you have a simple, a simple low complexity spectrum, then you could even do it right away on a standard steel target um, without any further treatment of the sample. Yeah, finally, what do we offer you with the, with the Autoflex Max as our instrument of, of choice here? Uh, so the Autoflex Max contains a smart beam laser, which is a solid state laser, um, maintenance free with very, very long lifetime, um, and very flexible also in the application. So whatever preparations you use, if it's really thick one, solid uh, preparation, solid preparation if it's a bit thicker or um, yeah, whatever you use, the smart beam laser covers everything. Um, in the lower molecular weight range, we have a very nice resolution without changing any method. In the beginning, when, I, when we uh, saw the film together or the movie, um, there was a little it, uh, thing where I choose a method to select the parameters for a certain mass range. So now this panoramic extraction allows us to get a very, very good resolution from the masses of 600 up to 6, 7,000 without changing the method. And therefore, yeah, it's again making the instrument very, very easy to handle. Self-cleaning ion source, so you don't have to open the instrument. You can just use the infrared laser, which is built into the instrument, and the infrared laser heats up the, the ion source and cleans everything uh, so you don't need any specific training to really do this source cleaning here. And therefore, of course, the source cleaning just takes 20 minutes, and after 20 minutes, you're back into business. As I've shown you with the um, last spectra, so the one of the, the PECs, the TOF TOF is also good, of course, for single end group analysis, because this is really the advantage in doing MSMS experiment, in the MSMS experiment, you break the molecules into two pieces, and of course, each, each part of the molecule only contains one end group. And in this case, you have the possibility to detect really single end groups with the MSMS. Yeah, flash detector, so we can um, operate the instrument for any mass you want, so small molecules as low as a few hundred up to very large polymers as high as a uh, few hundred kilodaltons, uh, we can run the, the system with a single detector without changing it. And finally, what we now implemented in the latest version, we have a 10-bit digitizer, <clears throat> which increases the dynamic range of the instrument uh, by a factor of four compared to the 8-bit digitizer we had before. And this, of course, gives you the advantage that uh, broader distributions of polymer are still visible in the higher mass range without saturating the lower mass signals. Generally, Bruker, I would, yeah, we are the leader in, in moldy top analytical solutions. We are, have proven moldy uh, solutions like the moldy imaging the TLC moldy, which you can also use, as I've shown you, for the analysis of synthetic polymers. 
Additionally, we have specific software workflow tools like PolyTools, Polymerics, or the Skills Lab software. So the first two ones for polymer analysis and the last ones for statistic analysis, like you've seen it in the Kyocera um, workflow. And finally, we have a globally leading installed base with more than 25 years of experience in uh, multi-trough analysis. Um, on the right-hand side here, you see our portfolio right now. So it's the Microflex, the Autoflex, Ultraflex, and uh, the biggest one is the Rapiflex. Finally, why should you use Molditov for your analysis to come back to the introduction? So Molditov in general, it's very, very simple to use. Of course, there are always samples that, um, yeah, <clears throat> that are a bit harder, but most of the samples just run right away. It's easy to, to learn. Um, so typically a training of a half a day should be enough just to train people to work with the instrument, of course not change, uh, solving the, the biggest challenges. Um, speed is always an issue. As I've shown you, it just takes a minute a few minutes to, until you really have the results and get your ad group characterization, for example, or average masses from the uh, Molitov instrument. You have direct access without any big calibration. If I do a calibration, I just do it because I want to be as accurate as possible, which makes sense, but you don't have to. Depending on your tolerance, um, you can also leave out this calibration, so then you get directly the end groups from your spectrum. And as I've shown you with the hard disks, for example, we, can, we are also able to really um, analyze pretty tough samples from surfaces and, and so on. And we finally offer you the complete solution with industry standard software. And with this slide, I would like to finish my talk and um, yeah, I would like to open the question and answer session if I should do it or. Thank you very much, Falcon, for a really, truly interesting uh, seminar. Now we're going to move, as you mentioned, now we're going to move on to um, the last part of the, today's webinar, which is the question and answer session. And I'm delighted to uh, let you know that we've had lots and lots of questions coming in. So, so thank you so much, everyone, for that. Um, <clears throat> the first one. Uh, can I also analyze copolymers with Molditoff? Um, yes. It's possible to analyze copolymers. It depends always a bit on the mass range, of course. Um, if you go to higher masses, then the complexity of the copolymers are getting uh, too high. Um, so there are just too many possibilities to, to have different combinations of monomers. Um, but in general, yes, copolymers can be analyzed. The typical mass range that I would say here is, is up to 5 kilodalton approximately. Um, in this case, you would not go with the poly tools. You would typically go with a polymeric software. This is the second product that we offer. Um, the polymeric software can generate such nice two-dimensional plots of the distributions of the different monomers um, and um, yeah, can handle copolymers, which is polytools is not able to do. Um, but yes, you can analyze copolymers with the Molitov as well. Perfect. Thank you very much for that. Um, next question. In your presentation, you have shown a spectrum of a 100 kilodalton polymer. Um, is it also possible, possible to run higher mass polymers? Um, yeah, higher mass possible, uh, polymers are also possible. I, I think I mentioned it during the talk already shortly um, that we have run, uh, so I personally, my record is 600 kilodalton, um, but we have also a, a customer of ours, um, he recently just ran a mega dalton, so this is possible. The thing is always that, of course, the higher the mass, the less information you get out of your sample. So, of course, you can generate or you can calculate average masses, which is often already um, a very good thing to have this information. Um, but if you 
go for very high masses, then in the end you can, of course, not do any end group analysis anymore because you don't have the oligomeric resolution anymore um, and therefore extrapolation down to zero is just not possible. But yes, you can run these high mass polymers, but the limit in this case is really the information content that you have. Thanks. Thanks very much. That's perfect. Um, it, as I said, lots, lots of questions coming through, so thank you so much for that, and we'll try and get, try and get through them all. Um, is it possible to analyze ionic polymers? Um, yes, it is. <laughs> In general, ionic polymers are possible, but um, so I have some experiments with uh, polyanions. Um, polyanions can be analyzed by, um, yeah, Ion exchange is the first step always because you always have to be sure that it's always the, the same counter ion. Typically, polyanions are, of course, uh, acids, polyacids, and therefore you have to transfer them completely into the hydrogen form. This can be done by ion exchange uh, step. And then afterwards, they fly quite nicely. But this is really a step... Um, which has to be done in advance. Because otherwise, if you have a mixture of, of counter ions, if you have, uh, for example, a mixture of sodium and potassium and hydrogen, now just imagine if a polymer contains 10 acid groups, then it could be 10 hydrogen, it could be 10 uh, sodium, it could be 10 potassium, and it could be anything in between. So four, five sodium, three potassium, and two hydrogen. Now just imagine how many combinations you have. And then, of course, with every step, with every combination that you have additionally, um, you get another drop in the signal intensity of your ion. And this, of course, makes the overall ion signal intensity afterwards too weak, and therefore you need to have an ion exchange step before you really uh, analyze such samples. Um, this is, by the way, also... I, I can't remember exactly, but it's a publication that my former colleague, so he retired last year, Franz Meyer, and he had a publication in the late 90s. It was about water-soluble polymers, and there was also the detailed protocol with the ion exchange beads, because it's also not possible to use any kind of ion exchange beads here, so it's a very special one. But this is written down in the publication, so um, this is one thing. The second part, sorry for, for this extended answer, but it's a bit more complex. <laughs> um, the second part of um, the, the, the ionic polymers is, of course, polycations, and polycations is really, until now, I only had a um, quite bad experience. So only very, very low molecular weight samples could be ionized, but the, the higher masses uh, until now, I haven't got any good spectra. Thank you yeah. very much for that, Falcon. Hopefully, hopefully you can get better spectra in the future. Um, the next question, first of all, they want to thank you for your clear presentation. So, so thanks again, Falcon. Um, can we use it? Uh, can we use it for block polymers? They've given the example yeah. of EO um, slash PO, for example. Clear, yes. So. Depending again, like I mentioned already in the, in the first question, um, depending on the molecular weight range. But the EOPO is one of our standard examples that we have here in the lab also, which we use in trainings as well. Uh, so this works quite nicely, but limited to a mass range up to, yeah, let's say, five kilodalton. Great. Um, <clears throat> following on with, uh, with copolymers, uh, the end group is end group analysis easy for copolymers? Uh, yeah, well, it, in the end, often you have to also, if you use the software in uh, polymerics, for example, it's not as easy as polytool. So it's not just that you feed something in and uh, you directly get the uh, results out. So you have to make suggestions, and the polymeric software finally tells you, yes, this could be, but in the end, the thing is also that you always get the combination of the end groups. So you don't get um, yeah, a single end group analysis, but you just get the mass of the, the, the combined end groups. And this is in the end for a block copolymer E or PO. Yes, in general, if it's a lower molecular weight, that's definitely possible. 
Thank you. Are there any guidelines which determines if a polymer flies well or not? Um, no, guidelines, I, I would not say that there are guidelines um, that you can follow. What I always recommend, if you just Google for NIST, polymer, and moldy, um, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, they have a nice database of uh, sample preparations um, listed there. And this is always, if you have a polymer and you're not sure how to prepare it, then definitely take a look in this little database and uh, most often you find something. And otherwise, join meetings in your country. Um, this is where you find other yeah, people working on synthetic polymers and mass spectrometry, and we all have the same problems independent which mass spectrometer we have. So use the community and maybe use the, the database at the NIST. Definitely. But there's Thank no you. general yep. method. Um, how, how do you determine branching in polymers if intrinsic microporosity, in brackets, PIM1? Um, the, the branching in the end you cannot really the, the only thing what you can do is really you get the, the overall mass nothing else um, the branching degree you, you cannot really tell how much branching is in there except this is really related to a mass change the only thing what we do here is we, we analyze the, the, or the molecular mass so we detect the molecular masses and if between a linear and a branch polymer, if there's a no mass change, then of course we don't see it. We only can see it by MSMS, which is shown here as a very simple example of a three star. Um, yeah, but otherwise um, there's no possibility. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the solvent-free sample preparation. Is this the standard method? How is, how is the sample fixed to the sample carrier? Are there alternative methods? Yeah, so I would not call the solvent-free sample preparation uh, the, this standard method, even if I love it very much, because the solvent-free sample preparation has one big advantage over all the other preparations. Typically, it's dry droplets, so you mix your sample solution, your matrix solution, and the salt solution, and afterwards just let it dry on the sample plate. Um, the solvent-free preparation avoids any separation of um, different molecular masses, for example, or different end groups. Um, if you have different solubilities, of course, it might happen that these molecules participate later in the, in the preparation, and therefore they are more found in the center of the preparation. So it gives you finally inhomogeneous preparation. That's something what you avoid with the solvent-free preparation. So standard solvent-free, I, how I do it is really that I just mix my sample, my matrix and my salt in a mortar or in an Eppendorf vial uh, together with two steel balls and vortex it very strong. And then I have a fine powder, which is the mixture. And then I put just a very, very low amount on the, on the sample carrier and... Um, just press it down and scratch it off again that only minor amounts are really remaining on the sample carrier plate. And that's how it's really fixed on the, on the carrier plate. So Thank there you. are different methods. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Lovely. Thank you very much for that, Falcon. So um, we've only got time for one more question. So if we haven't had a chance to answer your question, I know there's lots and lots of them coming through, then uh, we will respond to you via email with an answer. Um, but the last question is, um, in your presentation, you have always um, talked about the autoflex. What about the other Molditoff systems that you offer? Yeah, well, in, in general, of course, all the Molditoff systems are able to detect synthetic polymers. This is not the, the limitation of the instrument itself. Um, the Technic is able. Um, the reason why I don't like the Microflex, for example, which is our 
smallest instrument so much for synthetic polymers is that the microflex um, has no possibility for MSMS. It has a smaller sample carrier, cannot, um, our TLC plates, for example, cannot be used in, in the microflex. So that's the limitation of this instrument. And often the ultraflex and the rapiflex are a bit of an overkill. So they offer definitely a better performance than the autoflex. And if someone has an ultraflex or a rapiflex in the lab, definitely you can use it for polymer analysis as well. But to buy an uh, ultra, ultra flex or a, a rapiflex only for polymer analysis, in my eyes, is often a bit of an overkill. Because you quite often have already information about your sample and not like biological samples where you just go for database searches or things like this. Yeah, that's why we focused with this uh, webinar on the autoflex. But in general, of course, the other instruments are also able. The larger ones, Ultraflex and Rapiflex, are able to do whatever the Autoflex does. And the Microflex is a bit limited in special applications, for example, like TLC. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Falcon. Well, that's all we've got time for today. Uh, thank you again very much to Falcon for um, today's informative discussion and presentation. And thank you to everyone joining us online and for your really interesting uh, questions. I hope you found this a worthwhile session. If you have any further questions, please feel free to email me at uh, editor at selectscience.net. That's editor at selectscience.net, and I will follow up with your questions for Falcon. Remember that you can also download a certificate of attendance in the related resources tab at the left of your screen. And if you would like to listen again to today's webinar or invite a friend to listen, it will be available to watch on demand in the next few days. Goodbye, and thank you once again for joining